Um, and the last eight years, the hallmark in some ways of the Obama, the Obama era has been a focus on innovation and the role of government and technology. So this seems like a great time to sit down, reflect on what's happened so far, and reflect on where we might be going from here. We have a terrific panel to do that with. Uh, to my right is Tony Scott. Tony is the Chief Information Officer of the United States, which I think is a terrific title. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. Uh, to Tony's right is uh, Phaedra Truros. Phaedra is the Chief Innovation Officer of the Libra Group. Uh, until recently, she was the Commissioner for the Technology Transformation Service at GSA, which houses 18F, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, and to Phaedra's right is Seamus Kraft. Seamus Kraft is the founder of the OpenGov Foundation. So we're going to get started. Uh, so Tony, I'm going to kick it off to you first. You uh, came into office as CIO uh, in February of 2015. Before that, you had been in the private industry for a long time at VMware, Microsoft, Disney. When you came into office, this was your first first spin in, in public service. You looked at government IT. Be honest, what was your reaction? Well, actually, uh, I don't think for me there was a lot of surprises because I think the um, challenges that face government IT are common challenges that face any really large, you know, uh, institution that's been around for a long time. And it's one of those classic dilemmas. You have, you know, a business, in this case government, that you have to run while you reinvent yourself and try to, you know, transform to something that you see as inevitable. And you know, the difference between the government and the private sector is, frankly, the scale is uh, pretty awesome. And then second, you know, there's a different governance mechanism between the two. So uh, I didn't know a lot about the inner workings of the government. And for me, that was the biggest challenge, just understanding how stuff works. But the, you know, the Uber challenges, I think, are largely the same, uh, you know, across the, across the two places. Okay, but when you say you hear horror stories about the state of government technology, people come into office and they're sort of uh, alarmed by what they find. Does that does that resonate with you? Or oh, sure. And one of the things that we've worked on, and I think historically, frankly, we didn't do a great job of, was dimensionalizing um, the size of the problem so that you could actually then do something about it. Um, and I saw this actually in the private sector as well, but um, here, you know, everybody would sort of look at their shoes and complain about the state of IT, but we hadn't done a really good job of saying, here's what that means in dollar terms, here's what it means in terms of service to citizens, here's what this means in terms of the abilities of agencies to either not do or do their uh, mission, and so I think for the last two years, we've been focused heavily on dimensionalizing it in a way that it can be then action, you know, and and let's do something different than what we've been doing. And if you had to distill down for a layperson what the what the challenges are, just you know, three sort of quick bullet points. What why is the state of government IT the way that it is? Well, there's there's three paradigms that have to change. One is, um, and, and and this is, I think, largely the problem is doing your architecture, whether it's infrastructure or applications, based on your existing org charts, probably a bad idea. When you can compare the two and they're a mirror of one another, you know you're in deep trouble because it means you're not customer oriented, it means you're not thinking about all of the possibilities that you know this rapid digital digitization of every enterprise in the world um, is experiencing. You're not taking advantage of all those lessons. And so, you know, the idea that, you know, even the smallest of agencies can do the same kind of job as the largest of agencies when it comes to infrastructure, cybersecurity, or even, you know, creating interesting to use you know, applications and websites is just wrong. And, um, and I think we have an opportunity to leverage um, more modern concepts that aren't org chart based and existing, you know, financing schemes based, existing ways of doing appropriations and all of that sort of stuff. That's that's going to have to change over time. Okay. So building technology with a focus on how citizens are using it rather than Serving the government citizens. agency. That, exactly. Okay. It's, it's the old, you know, the, the org chart model that we followed for decades is 
I do something and I shove it out the door and it's consumed by people. And the newer model is, you know, understand who your customers are and understand a lot more about what they want and make it easy for them to get what they need and want to do. And they shouldn't have to know how your org chart works, you know, or how you're organized to get the capabilities and services that they need. Okay, and Fedra, when you were at GSA, you oversaw the creation of the Technology Transformation Service. Part of the uh, the ambition of that service was to solve exactly some of these problems. Can you explain how, what the sort of solution that you came up with, uh, how that's supposed to work? Absolutely. So I think, it, you know, different to Tony, who had come from large companies, I'd come from the startup world. So when I came to the government, I saw user interfaces from the 1980s and systems written on programming languages from the 1970s, like COBOL, paper everywhere. You know, and all of this wasn't delivering the service that the American public expected and, and deserved. And it was all coming at an $80 billion price tag a year. So for me, it was a complete shock being a complete newbie to government. Um, and one of the things that we saw at GSA was that we could be the convening power for a lot of these different initiatives and technology that could help solve this problem. We could be the place where we could land initiatives, where we could experiment with new things. We could use our acquisition arm to rethink the way we acquire technology, um, and, and that really needed a, a permanent home. And so the creation of the Technology Transformation Service was to create a permanent home that could not only house some of the successful initiatives like 18X, Presidential Innovation Fellowship, but also be the launching pad for some of the really cool products and platforms that we're building for the government like login.gov and cloud.gov. And how uh, how much how far have we moved along the sort of timeline of, of fixing some of these problems through something like that TTS? How, how far along have we just made baby steps in the last couple of years? Or I think it's, is it it's, solved? it's only a couple of years. The technology transformation is very new, but it's based on the work, the hard work um, of of many technology initiatives within GSA and a lot of uh, collaboration with the White House, of course. And I think we made baby steps. I think one of the things that I like to start off by telling telling people is that the government is not a company where you can switch in a system in and out or change a policy and it's done. It's an industry and it's the last industry to be disrupted by technology at that. So it's one of these things where like any industry that's being disrupted, like transportation being disrupted by autonomous vehicles and supply chains being disrupted by drones, it's going to be very experimental and very messy in the beginning as you try and figure out what works. And once you do, then you can take those things and scale them. I think the Obama administration was very experimental and messy, and necessarily so, because you're at the beginning of this disruption. And now the next administration has, has, is responsible, hopefully, for taking, these, taking what works and scaling them up. Okay, one of the, the messinesses involved the, the relationship with the vendor community, right? Yes. The federal government spends $80 billion in technology every year. The federal government itself is only building a small percentage of that. Vendors have said that it, the process, this messiness, has been a little opaque, a little hard for them to plug into and serve whatever role they need to serve. Do you? I mean, you headed up one of the, the sort of major pillars of this movement. Did you, what does that critique? Does that resonate with you? Or so I think um, I was going to not talk about procurement this early in the morning, <laughs> but I see actually that my it's my true. leading HNF procurement hacker is here, <laughs> Dave Zaganich. Um, so. Hello, Dave. Um, so I will talk about it and risk putting you all to sleep. So I, I blame, unfortunately, decades-old procurement practices in the government for the massive disconnect we have between the federal government and really innovative forward-thinking forward -thinking companies in the metaphysical Silicon Valley. I don't mean just California. I mean everywhere. And it's because to get onto the government contract, it's a long and arduous process that can take over a year and hundreds, hundreds of thousands of contracting dollars. Once you're in, you're, no, you're not guaranteed to sell, and that sales process is very, very long. So there's no incentive right now for really forward-thinking technology that the private sector has access to to come in and work with the government. And I think that's a big problem. The ones that do come in and find a way to come in and hack the process or use a prime or somehow make it work, um, you know, their sales cycle is so long that it's actually very, very difficult to work with them. So I feel like it's not just a matter of figuring out how 18F or TTS works with the vendor community. It's about figuring out how the federal government works with the vendor community, and that needs to be hacked tremendously if we want to move forward. Okay, excellent. Um, Seamus, can you talk a little bit about, uh, I mentioned you're the founder of the OpenGov Foundation. Co-founder. Co-founder, co I apologize. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, um, just give the brief origin story of why you ended up, you worked on the Hill, how you ended up heading up that foundation? 
Sure. Uh, I like to say we weren't, uh, I'm not just the co-founder, I'm also one of our first clients. Um, I was on the oversight committee, which Nancy uh, spent some time on back in the day, but uh, I was working on in the legislative branch, and uh, we didn't have the tools to do our job. So for many of the same reasons that, that uh, 18F exists, uh, the PIF program exists, USDS exists, we did not have <coughs> software to, uh, to legislate. Now, this is around SOPA and PIPA. Um, and so we went into a room, we came back three days later, and we said, we need to bust open this legislative process and modernize it. Just, I'm sorry to interrupt. So those were copyright bills that a lot of people on the internet yeah. did not enjoy. And well, they, around citizens had views that they were trying uh, rather desperately to share with their government, which is the thing. And the critical infrastructure of, uh, of government is still paper in too many ways, and so those views weren't getting in. So we built this, a tool called Madison that hacked that process open, stopped SOPA, crowdsourced an alternative, and woke up the next morning and were like, whoa, this is what we should be doing. Um, and that's how the Open Yield Foundation came into it. Okay, and what are you focused on building now? Yeah, we're working uh, with legislatures, state, local, and the U.S. Congress to, in many ways, take what's happened on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and bring that innovation, bring that pipeline of talent into government and ultimately build a legislative operating system that's digital, open, and pumping out open legal data. Dave Zvenich is an inspiration of mine. We did a lot of this work for the DC Council, but I think it's an instructive moment. Um, what we just said there is taking uh, lessons learned on one end of Pennsylvania Avenue and bringing, bringing them to the other. That needs people, that needs talent. Uh, the, the fundamental problems and promise of 18F and USDS haven't changed. Congress needs that. State local legislatures need that. You know, Code for America is out there still doing great work. We're doing work across the country. So I think I know that the election may have not been expected, but I think that the fundamental reason that we're all here in, in Washington now hasn't changed at all. So we've talked about opening up legislative data. We've talked about um, creating services, online services that work better for citizens. You uh, come out of the Republicans, you work on the Hill on the Republican side of politics. One of the things that a lot of people are thinking about right now is how does the how does a new administration uh, that might come from that sort of ideological perspective think about these uh, these sort of innovations? Is it does it sort of line up with the way that they might be approaching? If you could speak for all Republicans, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I know some of us are precluded from talking about uh, the incoming administration. That's but that's what we've. Well, if I could, I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> But as a uh, recovering uh, congressional Republican digital staffer, um, I, I would say that there's no perspective different than the one we have on the stage right now. Uh, I think this is a beautiful opportunity to put the, the real core values of civic technology and open government, gov tech, whatever hashtag you want to put in front of it, uh, to the test. Um, you know, the promise of 18F really wasn't going to be tested until an administration changed. And I think that uh, a lot of these issues haven't been on the Trump team's list. I do know that there are some good people just starting to get into place right now um, who need to talk to everybody who's here right now who's created these projects. Um, but bad software, bad data, bad process, that knows no party affiliation. Uh, and I think that's where the new administration starts. The biggest risk to the progress going away, though, is those who have created it, and who are here right now, some of them in this room, walking away right now. And uh, the next administration, no matter how you felt about the election result, needs you just as much as President Obama needed you and called you. Peter, do you have any um, insight into that question? There has been a little bit of debate over the last week of people that have worked in these, whether it's 18F, USDS or a CIO or CTO shop in an agency, whether they stick around. What do you have any? So, you know, this is a difficult one because I'm getting a lot of people coming to me asking me, should I stick around? And I've been telling people, go where you think you will make the most impact. Um, that's my general philosophy. But I also think we need to remember that, you know, a statistic that I like to use is that in the average tenure at Google is 13 months. So we have to remember that this is a younger generation of techies that move through the ecosystem through the private sector pretty quickly. And they're gonna move through the ecosystem that's been created now in the civic tech movement. You might get an 18 effort that then goes to um, then goes to DOJ to be on the digital service team or goes to Code for America or goes to start a civic tech company or work at a civic tech incubator. And I think that we need to realize that that's the reality that we're facing with. 
that we're faced with and that we should try and enable that mobility rather than try and keep people in organizational structures. And so it's not a bad thing if people, every time we have a new administration, there's a natural flow of people um, trying new things. That's not such a bad thing if that happens right now. Yeah, I actually think it's a great thing. As long as there's some continuity in terms of knowledge management and you can pass the baton along, I think a fresh set of eyes is always important. And I think the more people move around, the more they'll gain a really holistic perspective of the government, which is not, which is massive. It's just massive. It's the size of hundreds and hundreds of Fortune 100 companies. And there's so much to do um, that I'd be, you know, at H&F, we were always encouraging people, yes, go to the digital service team. This happened in the UK, too, with GDS. They had, um, GDS was a centralized team, and then people started flowing out into the different ministries and started, and state and local, and started kind of a movement of change that way. And I think that's very possible here, too. Well, and I think the GDS uh, example is instructive uh, in the change in party, right? Yeah. Like the whole My Society crew that came in and in many ways founded GDS, they survived a transition. So this is in the UK. Yeah. There is a government digital service office that does a lot of the work that yeah. is. They're actually, they're actually the, I think we have to hat tip them all the time because they are the first um, of all the countries that did this and they did this very well. And many of the things that we've done are, like truly emulating, emulating them. Okay. Um, if folks can get their questions ready, I'm going to come to you all in, a, in just a few minutes. Um, one of the other, so the GDS example in the UK was part of what inspired this work in the United States. Another thing that inspired this work in the United States was uh, healthcare.gov's launch, uh, which was bumpy and, and took some time to sort of write. Could that happen again? Have we fixed the problems that led to the, the um, sort of initial failure of healthcare.gov? I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think there's been, let me say two things. One is, I think there's been great work done, so healthcare gov is in much better shape but uh, than it was, but um, the underlying legacy uh, systems and infrastructure are still there. Um, and ultimately, you've got to go address those uh, issues. And across this administration, we've done great work on improving user interfaces on, you know, beginning to attack some of uh, these issues. But underlying much of what actually runs the government is, you know, decades old stuff. And it's costly to run, it's expensive to protect, and ultimately has to be replaced. And, and so you got to somehow have a theory of the case about how that gets done and over what kind of time frame. And, uh, and so I think all of the work that's gone on is leading up to, you know, a set of critical decisions about how you go attack this at scale, taking the lessons that uh, have been learned during this administration and then going straight at it. Um, I hope that's what happens. And you've talked a bit in the past about President Obama's personal engagement with technology. That you have a photo in your office of him looking very, looking at an iPad, a demo of something, and looking very excited. How important is it to have? Um, this is. I feel like this is a leading question. How important is it to have? A, a, is it important to have a president who has that sort of hands-on appreciation for technology, or is that you know presidents outsource all sorts of responsibilities to other people and? Therefore, it's not necessary. Well, you know, I think you can get leadership in a whole bunch of different ways. I think it's been great that President Obama has taken that on personally. But I think you've seen examples in other administrations where the lead for something wasn't necessarily the president, but it was somebody who had visibility and who, you know, had a point of view and could provide strategic, you know, leadership and inspiration. And so... Um, every ad administration, I think, finds its, you know, balance point and its champions for change in, uh, you know, whatever spaces they care about. And I'm pretty sure that will emerge, you know, uh, okay. uh, in, in any administration. So. Okay. Uh, so, again, the hashtag is Upgrading Washington. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions off of, tw of excuse me, off of Twitter. Uh, and we're going to take a couple of questions from the room. Do we have a microphone? We have a microphone. Uh, does anybody have a question? Let's start up here with Alex. That Alex Howard does. <laughs> and if you can uh, give your name and affiliation if it's relevant. Sure, uh, Alex Howard. Uh, first one's wearing the tech policy hat, second's wearing the Sunlight Foundation hat. Um, you can see in the technology community a lot of concern 
about uh, what will happen next. If you look at campaign finance, there was very little support in the incoming administration. How would you suggest that the next administration appeal to that community to serve? Because it seems like not only retaining talent, but bringing in talent will be a challenge. Um, and that's to your points about having people at the table who understand technology from the beginning, important. Um, how will you get technologists to stay in government and to be in government? Will that model, in fact, be questioned instead of uh, going back to the Bush administration era where outsourcing was really the, the, kind of the word, word of the day? And then the second follow-up is uh, technology and open government have been very closely aligned in this administration. We've seen very little from the incoming transition team or the campaign about open government in any sense. What do you see as the future of all of the programs and all the databases that have been maintained for the last eight years? Just a, if I can add a twist to that, the, the coupling of open government and government innovation, as you mentioned, has sort of been one and the same. I think President Obama's sort of initial approach to these topics was he, he paired those two. Is that necessary or could you have more innovative government digital services without the focus on uh, open government and transparency? Well, let me address at least part of the question here. Um, look, during this administration, we did open source policy. There was a lot of great progress on open data initiatives. Um, I don't think any of that stuff <laughs> stops. I think, mm. uh, you know, the business community, um, you know, has embraced this and is counting on that to continue. And I don't hear any voices saying, stop doing that or it's not, you know, worth it doing that. Uh, and so... And, and, you know, the whole government's run by a whole bunch of career people who are here and will be here for the next administration and the one beyond that uh, and so on. And I think this has become part of the way government works. So I don't expect some of those things to change much, particularly where there's broad support in the business community. Um, I think the question really is, you know, what else on top of that gets done or how does the direction shift at, at all? And I don't think anybody knows that yet. I think it's a little bit premature to sort of make that call. I know that a lot of people are watching and anxiously awaiting and, um, you know, me too. Um, but I, I think it's a little too early to make any prediction about which way uh, things go. I do think some of this is you know, the, the digitization march is inevitable, and the really only question is, how fast is it going to go? Um, does this next administration accelerate or, you know, uh, you know, not put an emphasis on it? And I, again, I think it's too early to tell. Yeah, I, I would think, uh, just building off of that, um, the only thing that can jeopardize the progress made over the last eight years, when this community it not even grew up, it, it became a thing and then grew up, is is for those who've created that progress to, to walk away and then to not have that extended hand uh, to those coming in after, um, many of whom haven't been identified. You know, you're right, Alex, this wasn't a big issue in uh, the Trump, Trump campaign from what I saw, um, but whoever's coming in needs help. Um, and our country still needs us who are here now moving forward in, in some way, shape, or form, whether it's civil society, whether it's coming up to Congress and creating a congressional digital service, uh, the work remains, and uh, we are a community. We just may have a different seat at that community table, um, but I don't see any of the leaders here, here changing, and I think one of the coolest things about President Obama and his leadership is it's been true leadership. It's not just being the leader and giving orders. It's identifying talent, bringing it in, retaining it, empowering it, and then that talent staying as leaders themselves. And that's what I'm seeing, whether it's at 18F, um, USDS, you know, the Dave Zvenich's of the world, the Robin Carnahan's of the world. They're not going anywhere, and they need our help. And if you, there's been a lot of talk about how the technology industry or the people you're the area where you would tend to recruit people to work at an 18F or USDS tends to lean Democratic. I mean, that if you look at uh, voting, donations, all that sort of thing, is there any hope of recruiting 
conservatives and Republicans from that industry to come in? How big of a pool is it to recruit from, from people that might actually share the sort of ideological orientation? Uh, on By that measure, it's small. Okay. Um, but I think that might be the point, is that we don't have to measure by that anymore. What The, the snowplow effect, I think, that Code for America has created, that the Sunlight Foundation has created, that 18F USDS, the PIF program have created, have almost removed the need for that partisan affiliation coming in. If you are a technologist, if you are an engagement specialist, you do need to come and work in a civic space at some point, um, whether that's local, state, county, federal, federal agency, Congress. The work remains, and it's not a question of who you voted for. I think you said it nicely, Nancy, before we started, which is about the Peace Corps model, right? So people don't join the Peace Corps because they're Republican or Democrat or because Trump's in office or Obama's in office. They join because they want to do some good, serve their time, et cetera. And I think we need to get to the point where this is not a democratic movement. This is a good for government, patriotic movement, um, regardless of party affiliation. I totally agree. I've talked to hundreds of people and what their challenge and what motivates them is solving big, hard uh, problems. And that's what gets people up in the morning and gets them going. And to the extent that we can, you know, work on that problem set, I think you're going to get the best America has to offer. I don't think it's a party issue. Okay. So it is my job to be provocative. If you look at some of the work that uh, the U.S. Digital Service has done has been around refugee work. You can see an incoming administration has a different policy orientation. Those people are asked to do different sort of work on the same problem area. Uh, at what point do they make decisions about whether or not they want to participate? Is that you're making that decision as, you know, I'm a technologist, I build the technology I'm asked to build, or is there a role for sort of uh, imposing your own mm. values and judgments on that? Yeah. I wouldn't let the micro dominate the macro. We could challenges in Veterans Administration and IRS and the Department of the Interior. I mean, there's no agency of the federal government or anything that it does that isn't without its challenges. And uh, so, you know, maybe priorities shift among, you know, certain areas. You know, maybe one thing goes away, but there's tons of other uh, sort of opportunities. And so, you know, it, might be a problem in a micro case, but I think in the macro, there's lots of stuff to do. Okay. The question. Yeah. Let's just wait for the mic. Thanks, uh, Rob Cullery, and I'm with an investment group. Maybe uh, this question's for Tony. Could you speak a little bit about uh, governance of, uh, of your area? Meaning, is there a board of, uh, board of governors, board of, uh, uh, board of directors, or an advisory board, and and to what extent um, is that uh, made up of uh, either political party appointees or industry appointees? Well, our, our governance comes from Congress. So um, my team works um, because there's an appropriation every year to OMB. I've had the pleasure in the last two years of making, I think, more than a dozen appearances before uh, various committees and so on, and that's how we... That's how government works. Uh, it's like having a, a board, but uh, of directors, but uh, you know they're elected rather than uh, what happens in the private sector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll say, in all of the conversations in front of all of those committees, they've gone out of their way to say good tech, good cyber, and what have you is not a partisan issue. Uh, and I truly believe that. I mean, there's not been a hint of, you know, any of these things, you know, being either a Republican or a Democrat uh, sort of issue. Uh, some of our biggest supporters and fans have actually been, um, you know, on the Republican side uh, during this administration. So uh, I hope that spirit continues, um, and uh, I expect that it will. To, just to add to what Tony said, Kevin McCarthy, the House leader, recently tweeted out, we need to modernize government. HNF and USDS are our best chance at doing that. Some paraphrasing of that tweet. And I think that was a great sign to all of us that this is a nonpartisan issue. Just, I actually have it here. We need yeah. to modernize government. <laughs> Programs like 18F and USDS hold great potential for our country. And he is House Majority Leader, so. Yeah. 
Is there excited? Um, yes. Uh, Rich Butel. Uh, Tony, you said three key paradigms need to shift, and you talked about the first one, which was um, don't map against your chart. What are the other two key paradigms? Well, one's shift. the technology paradigm. So, um, you know, we have this focus on in technology over the last 40 years that's um, focused from a design point on interoperability, like everything should always interoperate with everything else. And uh, we've proven that we can do that, but there's now a higher order set of questions that have to be asked. Like, should I interoperate? Um, is the thing that I'm attaching to or communicating with safe and secure? And has it been compromised? And is it performing the way that it should? Um, and uh, in a lot of ways, our whole industry, and I'm talking about hardware, networking, software, and so on, have overemphasized interoperability and underemphasized the, some of these other notions of um, safety and security and, and so on. So I think, I think that's a paradigm that's got to change. NIST just did a great publication that starts to talk about this in the context of the Internet of Things um, and, you know, kind of outlines a, a path for the future. So I think that's the second paradigm. Uh, in the federal government, the third paradigm is funding. Um, and as you well know, the um, Modernizing Government Act starts to, you know, break that paradigm. Um, it reinforces the design by your org chart model, uh, meaning the current funding mechanism, ensures that we're cementing in place siloed implementations of technology. And in order to break that, we need to invent a new funding mechanism that lets us look at the design and the implementation of things in a, in a different way. So those are the three. So I do have to ask, there's work left for you to do. Um, do you stay on if you're asked? Um, I think it depends. You know, uh, I, uh, I'm really excited about the momentum that we've got going. And if it looks like that's something that makes sense, um, Please stay on. Please stay on. <laughs> but, uh, and look, everybody in this room, please stay on. <laughs> but but I, look, one way or the other, you, first you got to be asked. Sure. So nobody's asked <laughs> yet. Uh, but, it helps at least. <laughs> um, but look, I, I, this is so important to your point. We've got to stay engaged. This isn't, I don't think it's even an option. Um, if you care about our country, if you care about, you know, how government works, the credibility of our institutions, government being one of the key ones, you got to stay engaged in this space. There's just no, you know, backing away, I don't think so. Yeah, and that's exciting as hell. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. That's exciting as hell. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I really do appreciate it. And uh, thank you for a thoughtful conversation. Thank you for having us. Thank you.